So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the museum's first hybrid Tales from the Vault, actually first more in-person hybrid program we've done. So thanks for bearing with us as we try to work out all the kinks to this. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Logan Pappenport and he's going to tell us all about the Illinois River Circuit. Hi, Ziki. Hello, Daniel Pepe. So that's hello. Good to see everyone. And so my name is Logan Pappenport, <clears throat> and I'm the curator of anthropology at Dixon Mountain State Museum. And so today I want to tell you about a set of projects that is something that when I first learned about, I was a little bit surprised that not more people knew about. And that is the Illinois River Survey. And so the Illinois River Survey was a grassroots project that was started by staff at Dixon Mount State Museum in the 80s and 90s. And it is one such story of no funding per project, but an immense amount of information that was recovered as a result. And even beyond that, it goes into talking about how resources of Illinois are utilized, cultural resources being paramount to one place. But I think before we go to talking about the river survey in general and how that happened, we need to talk about the occupational history of Illinois in general. Because when you're talking about looking at various sites in Illinois, we have to kind of look at the landscape and how it was utilized in the past. So, as many know, I'm sure, Illinois has been occupied for 11 to 13,000 years. And so, the landscape of Illinois is made up of, well, what the state is named for prairies, tall grass, um, well, farming areas, and obviously the Illinois River and the Mississippi. And so the Illinois River Valley is one that we're going to be talking about today. And it's one that was extremely important to the people of the past. And it's important what we're talking about Illinois, and especially this is something that came up even before this talk today, is people drive through the state, they see farmland after farmland and crops, and it's hard to imagine it being anything other than that. However, it's important to remember what we're seeing now is a very different landscape than we would be dealing with even 200 years ago. So the landscape of Illinois, and specifically the Illinois River Valley, is one that was ripe for utilization by Native people, as well as the white settlers upon colonization. And so we can see that in the archaeological record very easily, but we even can still see that today in some of the revitalization efforts, such as happening at Enterquan, which you know, we will plug here in the pond right by Dixon Mounds is the second largest wetlands restoration project after the Fort Everglades. So that is a huge, huge project that's happening in Illinois which most people don't even think about. And so it's important to think about this abundant landscape and the state it was in when the initial explorers got here, I know the person with Marquette and Joliet. And so Marquette was said to say, we've seen nothing like this river that we enter as a the fertility of soil, its prairies and woods, its cattle, elk, deer, wildcats, mustard, swans, ducks, parakeets, and even beaver. There are small lakes and rivers which we sail in wide, deep, and still for 65 weeks. Now, for anyone that knows anything about normal river hydrology, you'll know that the Yellow River is very unique. It is not like other rivers. And part of the Illinois River's charm is are these backwater lake environments. 
And so that is what Marquette is seeing. And if I could find my pointer here. So you'll notice that as you're going down this river, this map, which obviously hand paid, so it's not perfect, perhaps completely accurate, but you see areas such as this with these large stretches of wide areas of water. And you see it again in further maps made by settlers. River the end of one. And so these backwater lakes would have had a fantastic environment for occupation. And so when we look at civilization in the past thousand years, we always see civilization in the other rivers. And the reason for that is multifaceted. Obviously, as humans, we need water. And so before the time of industrialization, water is vital to our survival, but not only because of the actual water, but because of the wildlife and the resources. Here is a, uh, here's a photo of Imaquan today. And so in my mind, Imaquan represents the best example of what these backwater environments would have looked like back when Marquette and Joliet arrived. And so you can see you have these tall grasslands and aquatic water, but you also have this just immense body here. And this is part of the river system. Now, with these bodies of water and this aquatic vegetation, you obviously get other types of wildlife. So these are all photos from Memoquan. In fact, just this year, we had 500,000 snow geese up in Memoquan. And I can tell you that is something that an Oklahoma boy coming down from the plains did not ever expect to see. And it was uh, quite a cacophony of noise as well. But with, with these types of uh, wildlife in the area, we could see how people in the past would have utilized these resources. And these resources, I know I have mostly birds up here, right? The birds, animals, beavers, fish, and mussel shell. And so all these things are what drew people to these areas. But generally, that's not what the river looks like today. Generally, the river is more structured and contained. However, the river is also higher. And that's in part because of lock and dam system. And the lock and dam system was a system which was created for convenience. And when we look at some of these older maps I had earlier, you can see right here, well, Lake Michigan and the Yellow River don't naturally connect out of its way. And that was one of the big points of Marquette and Joliet is that if they were to create a canal, that that portage would be much more manageable for getting goods up to Lake Michigan and further out through the Great Lakes Great Lake system. And so the lock and dams were a solution to that perceived problem. However, when you add Lake Michigan water into the system and try to make the river of Illinois very uh, convenient for boat travel, then you're also going to affect the natural environment and hydrology of that river. And so there are certain times in the past of the Illinois River where it was simply impassable, you know, you can't get through, it's not deep enough, you have to 
pick up your canoe and you have to walk. And I could understand how some of the white settlers would find that a tad inconvenient when you're trying to transport goods. However, when these systems were added in, one thing that was, I guarantee you, I thought about that time was cultural resources. So that brings up the need for a survey center. So the river survey has had, there are the rivers have various changes to the waterways as we've talked about. And among them are cultural resources. Now cultural resources are vital to why this survey happened. And they were not included in the initial river plan when managing the river back in the nineties. And that is something that is a problem. Now, cultural resources is a big word, but what, what is a cultural resource? Cultural resources can be anything from a burial site, a, an archeological village site, a steamboat crash, or even a 200 year old land. So cultural resources are not one size fits all, but they are ever present throughout the river system. And one thing that's interesting about a lot of archaeological sites along the river is that while they are not renewable, we can glean a lot of information from doing excavations and sample sizes from these sites to get a more complete understanding of how those cultural resources fit into the, the whole river system. So cultural resources naturally persist and they're not usually as big of an issue as it is in the river. However, that's also keeping in mind that with the change in hydrology, these sites are now inundated and constantly being eroded away. Generally, in most cases, federal law does protect a lot of these cultural resources. In my uh, in my previous job with the Peoria Tribal Indians in Oklahoma, I worked with the National Historic Preservation Act as well as NAC Prince and Health to protect some of these cultural resources. However, there's one problem that is happening with the Illinois River, and that is with these sites, if there's not a project happening, there's no reason for these cultural resources to be found. And while that Lowell and projects is occurring, these sites are being eroded in a limited way. So that is one challenge with the uh, with these cultural resources. Another one is, well, we already talked about the river is higher than the previous rivers. So these cultural resources are underwater, inaccessible, but it's something that archaeologists made in the 90s found out they were there, which triggered this whole survey. So let's talk a little bit about the change in the river. And so the river was fairly stable and has cycles for the past 3,000 years. Now, obviously, we being humans, we love to change our environment. It's one of the hallmarks of who we are. And so with change, comes some results for it. And so as you can see, there's a certain area that the river would meander to that would be consistent and predictable. But the single largest change that we see in the river system is all that water from Lake Michigan pumped in and channels being dug into the river so that, well, steamboats don't crash and cause more cultural resources down the line. And so this is one of the really big reasons why this survey is so important. It needs to be talked about and understood. And so here is a example of uh, 
some of the natural and man-made levees and where the archaeological sites fall into that whole plan. So you can see the man-made levees are significantly higher than what would be the natural levees. And the flood stages are also going up as opposed to where they were in the 1800s. And so this is a drastic problem for erosion as well as, well, destruction of the sites and moving artifacts around, which could explain why a lot of educational archaeologists, as they're walking along the river, they find a lot of artifacts being washed out of that time. So speaking of archaeologists, cultural resources are really important. And there are great reasons to do this survey, but they're not the only reason that this survey happened. Archaeologically, when you're talking about sites in the area, and this is this is Havana right here, and these are all various woodland sites. Now, after talking with one of the Dixon Mount staff members at the time who conducted this survey and asking, Okay, so we know how important the survey was. What was the trigger that caused you guys to do what you do? And so you said, well, at this time period, a lot of these woodland sites being mortuary in nature, there was a thought within some archaeologists that, well, maybe these people are more migrants, so they're not having village patterns that what, like what we used to see. Now, to me, and to this individual, that doesn't make sense. If you're gonna have these large mound sites, that you are gonna be a migratory people. And so one thing is during this time period, there's a site called the Liverpool Lake site. And this site is one that they went to and they did find a village, a woman village. And after surveying that river, they found a large span of site stretches all along the river of that particular site. And that triggers the, uh, the thought to, you know, this is almost a crazy thought when I say aloud, but survey the entire river. But if any of you know the individual I'm talking to, it probably doesn't surprise you. And so these photos are from some of those initial uh, initial surveys and excavations. Very uh, very eighties archaeology has some some very uh, just get comfortable and dig. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see that one of the big things here is look how low the water is. And so the archaeology at this time, it has to be done in a way that is quick. Because you have a limited amount of time in the dry season of the year to do this work. And so at this time, there was a volunteer effort, roughly 15 to 20 volunteers helping to survey the river. And so Here's a map of essentially where they started down in roughly this area. And you can see the lock of dams all across the way. Here is what they surveyed in, uh, in one year. And so when I first saw this map, I was like, no way, you didn't do that. And so I, I'm a logistical person. And so I asked, okay, how did you do that? And so the only funding they got was Dwayne Essery, former director of Dixon Adams, got $50 in gas money from his dad. <laughs> and he had a boat. So him and volunteers at Dixon Mounds started at Liverpool and 
they put surveyed and then someone leapfrogged past them and said boat and then met them at the end of their survey, new people got in the boat and they continued that pattern all the way up to Star Rock. Now, that is a tremendous amount of effort and ground to cover. And so I actually, I asked Dwayne to take me to the river when I first started here to kind of get an idea of what we would be doing. And so we were walking down the river and I see a barge coming down and it's loaded with grain. And so it's, it's loaded. Dwayne looks at me and he says, oh, we should follow that barge because if we follow the wake, the water goes in and we can survey as the water is receding. And I just, I was amazed to be honest, because I couldn't even imagine doing something of that nature. But that's what these guys were doing out there. Whenever they could, whenever the water was low enough. And the result of this is a survey of 166 miles with 208 archaeological sites. That is a fantastic amount of sites and could potentially help us alleviate our concern about not finding as many wooden villages as we might expect. Because it's important to remember what we talked about earlier with the landscape and hydrology, with a lot of these rivers all along the way, that is exactly how if I were to want to set up a village, I would definitely not want to be on a rough top and have to cart my water up somewhere be like, let's just go down where the water is. So what were the challenges that they came across as a part of this process? Well, as you can see, another result of the lock and dam system is an increased rate of flooding. Because while the Yellow River did flood, it was part of the natural process. And that flooding is what helped to create some of the backwater environments. And so you hear, you see here from the 1890s to 2010, it is easily doubled, if not tripled, the amount of flooding that's occurring. And so this is twofold of a challenge because this one makes it harder with higher levels to do the survey, but that also means more and more archaeological sites are being inundated and destroyed during this process. So time is paramount. The sooner you can get the survey done, the better, which is why I don't blame them for uh, taking that gas money and just let's get surveying right now. Because if, if they're waiting for funding, they, they could potentially still be there. And so flooding are obviously events that happen, but when you're talking about just the natural water level, you can see here, so the blue line is the historic, the purple line is the current, and this is in the farm which just is a control, a stable. Now, while there still obviously are some interesting flood events happening here, you notice how erratic the current or river water level is. To me, when I'm thinking about this in the landscape of the Illinois River Survey, I'm thinking, well, you have to be ready at a drop of a hat to go out and survey. And so I really appreciate the full work that Dwayne and others did back in the day to document this, uh, these 208 archaeological sites. And so it's important when you're thinking about these sites is with the amount of time you have, you have to really know where you're going and what you're looking for. And so in many cases, sites are actively being destroyed while they're doing the survey. And so, for example, as the water level goes down, 
there are features that they see, and those features need to be excavated before we understand those sites. So, when I came across this picture for the first time, I was like, that is quite the trench. But it makes sense when you're thinking about how the river functions now, because as the river level went up, sediment would be deposited and deposited and deposited. And so really once you found a feature at a certain level, this is the type of archeology span you have to do to get the full understanding of that site. And so this is something that I'm sure this was, okay, we have to get this done before it rains again or they open the gates. Because this site most likely is now underwater. And so when they would come across features, they had to excavate very quickly. And that results in where a lot of these pictures, I know I noticed it, these uh, these pit features that are being excavated almost uh, well obviously purposefully, but needing to document the features in their entirety while they have the opportunity. Whereas sometimes in other archaeological sites, you can take your time, document everything. That's not necessarily the case for this survey. It's about getting as much information and the cultural resources out of these sites in a time allocated. So overall, after the survey is said and done, what are we left with? So we have a very good assemblage of ceramics found from the survey. And this, you know, it obviously as you can see going from the edge of the Pretty much almost contemporary so and pretty much almost contemporary with current. And so that never really changed. And so, in addition to helping fill out a little bit of the pictures of what the landscape would look like in the woodland territory, it helps us add some more information to all these other types of as well. And have more comparative collections so that we can do similar work elsewhere. But we didn't just find ceramics. There is also, as most collectors will tell you, areas by face as projectile points, lithics. And so these lithics are really important because found with the ceramics, it can help us have a more complete idea of how the technology is developing over the uh, over the period in, in Illinois. And so with these type with these lithics, it allows us as archaeologists to be able to much more cohesively be able to date things as they're found, find them in context. And so when we talk about different cultural periods that are found in the riverbank survey, obviously you can see the majority that was found was Lake Woodman. So, Wayne and others question was maybe not completely answered now, they have a better idea. So, with 208, by, or 208 archaeological sites, you have the photo frequency of approaching 34% of the Lake Woodland. And you see quite a large amount of Mississippi as well. However, what I always found really interesting is uh, you see, as we get to the more broader historic period, that sharply drops down. And obviously, to me, that makes sense because as white settlers and colonization came in, 
there's less of a reliance on these waterways than what would have traditionally been. And so with this in mind, we can see a picture developing as a result of this work that's being done. And so with that, that's all the question, all the presentation I have for right now. I would like to open up the questions. And if I can speak to it, then I will be happy to do so. Yes, sir. You made a comment about uh, following the wake of barges to mm -hmm. locate some deep span on that on your thing on your own. Yeah, absolutely. So as these barges are loaded down with grapes, they're exceedingly heavy. And so just like any other boat, when they're going, they leave a wake. And so water, that water has to go somewhere. So as the wake goes out, so it goes in. And so when those barges with their tremendous amount of weight goes out, as it goes in, well, Dwayne and others would be surveying right behind them as the water recedes to see, okay, what features can we see in this receding water? What are we seeing on the ground and surface level here? And so he noted that as one of the heavier watercraft in the, in the river. And so that to me was very, it was almost a crazy idea. He, he said it to me, but it makes sense when you think about it. When you already do things in these limited amount of time, it's uh, it's just you have to work the way you got. And if you're having a unnatural process with the water, you might as well take full advantage of it. But what were they seeing? I mean, was it because they were removing the surface sand and sediment? So. No, there wasn't removing the surface sand. What it was doing is because the water was going back so much, a lot of times they could see the lithics, ceramics, because a lot of times when you're doing these surveys, um, and even today when you walk along the Elmer River, you can see ceramics just right there. And in some cases, as you're walking, you can see in the water, obviously it's a point or a biface or what have you. And so, by the water going in, they had more area that they could look at. And so when they know, okay, we saw a lot of ceramics here because that water was going in, now we can note this down and come back to here once the water levels are low. Yes. Second, uh, chair one of my observations on the Illinois River, uh, did, uh, there were survey and very points up and down the river when I first came to the museum. And uh, one of the most surprising things to me was we were down by uh, Moreland Island, which is kind of down near the, near the mouth. And uh, I, I didn't really have a good appreciation for what these barges can do. And especially when they're, when they're going up river, the channel relatively narrow, they can pull the water beyond Beyond where the where the, uh, uh, the barge is, and it, it's, it's just amazing to see the, the water level go go down as the barges are coming up. So the, 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 <laughs> this impact on the water level. Well, yeah, and so another thing that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about the Illinois River as it stands today is that it's not like the Illinois River is staying stagnant or there's not traffic on it. So when we're looking at the river, barges are going up and down constantly. And so as they're going up and down constantly, the water is being moved back and forth, back and forth. And if I haven't stressed it enough, that's just that is potentially destroying archaeological sites the entire time. And it's it's happening right now. And so that again speaks to the urgency of this river survey when it is done. Now, I would like to believe that there are better cultural resource management practices today than there were in the 80s and 90s. 
But in my previous work, I can tell you that that's not always the case. And so also wanted to say if anyone has any, any do you have asked you to have virtual questions? Yes, as well? and I have asked them to drop their questions. Okay. So so one thing about about this that's important to remember is that when we're looking at that map of the length of the survey. So you have to keep in mind some of the occupational sites that we know about. For example, some of the biggest sites for my people in Peoria would have been in Peoria or Pintui and then Grand Village up here. And so these, these uh, occupational theories and sites they were still being utilized, and I guarantee you that they were not there by Elizabeth. And so, when looking at these uh, river surveys, it gives us a much more complete picture of the past than what we could know otherwise. Archaeology is the greatest tool for understanding pre contact for not only us, but as well as tribal nations. Yes. So, were many of these sites were been revisited since then? Like, did they, or was it, or was it just the documented as much as they could, and now it's four years later? So, they have been revisited, but a lot of times these sites may not have everything that was there initially because of the erosion. And so, what's really important is to get a nice uh, vertical slice of the site while you can. Because that can allow you to do potential research down the line on that site. But at the end of the day, there's probably a large amount of these 208 sites that are no longer existing. Yes. Is the river ever been as low as it was in 88, 89, or is it um, I don't believe it has. I don't, believe so either. I don't believe it's ever gone that low before. And that's another reason why Dwayne and Nixon Mad staff went to uh, Liverpool. Is the whole reason they were there initially was because we know the water is low, and we know that Liverpool Lake site is there, and they happen to see all these other things along the riverbank as they were there doing excavations, and so that triggered this whole thing to actually occur. And if I'm if I'm honest from what I was been told to me, it's it was only once they started to really do the survey that the full breadth of the cultural resource that could potentially be lost in the other river came to light. Well and just looking at that graph that you put up about frequency of reaching flood stage. I mean, you can see that shift from, um, I think that was it, yep. yeah, the 80s to the 90s. Mm -hmm. And ever since we have not, <laughs> not had it as maybe. Um, yeah, we can see, you know, dry of time. Eight, eight to 90s, pretty dry, all that's considering slight uptick. And then 70s, 80s, and since the 90s, we've just been up and up, and the trend seems to be going only further and further up. So the potential for being able to do this kind of survey is losing ground every day, if not already impossible to get some of the things that they got to in the 80s and 90s. So, well, unless you go on the water, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and that's a good point about this was an extremely time sensitive activity. And so a lot of times you see archaeologists not only to excavate everything because they could come back potentially with new technologies, new methodology. But here it's kind of the option of these sites will be destroyed if we don't excavate. And so this is one of the places where 
archaeology being a destructive science is, I won't say it's a non factor, but these sites are already being destroyed. So if we can do good by documenting these sites, that's something that we need to do in my opinion. And are there any, any more questions? Well, if there's no more questions, um, I really appreciate everyone coming out today and giving me the opportunity to talk about this project. Um, and there's still, honestly, is a lot of work to be done with the assemblages that came out of this project. And so there's the potential for further research even to this day. And so that's something that I hope to be able to give a talk some of this in the future and have more analytical information about what these assemblages really mean about the occupation history of the River Valley. But anyway, 